Greetings and salutations, my history-loving mischief. Brian Guthrie, aka Guthron the Balding Bard, back with you again. This week's discussion will focus on the problem of scale and how it factors into a government's capacity to operate effectively and meet the needs of its population. One thing before we start. Owing to time constraints and life getting in the way, I'll be presenting this discussion in a much more straightforward manner. That said, let's begin. The problem of scale in a civilization's functionality dates back to antiquity, where Aristotle believed that a state possessed a limitation in size similar to the limits one sees in other things, like plants, animals, and structures. He argued a nation would lose its power if it grew either too small or too large. However, as David Hume would later contend, size and scale are entirely different concepts. Scale considers the size of something in relation to that thing's function. An example would be the human body and its capacity to take on certain actions. Returning to the topic, how do size and scale relate to political order or a nation's capacity to be effective and serve the needs of its constituents? For that answer, one must consider what function one attributes to a political entity. For the ancient Greeks, a political entity existed for one goal, excellence. To achieve that excellence, the citizens must learn to emulate the qualities of a good citizen. In typical aristocratic snobbery, Greek philosophers consistently defined a good citizen as one like themselves. To pass on these lessons thus required a person to spend time in the company of said excellent citizens. That placed a limitation on how large a society could be, as there were only so many noble citizens in existence. For Aristotle, that meant a society only large enough that it suffices for the conduct of life, but did not extend beyond a single view or the walk of a single day. Greece of antiquity comprised over 1,500 smaller republics, limited in size and scale, with those all joining together to form a society that would inspire people for the next three millennia. History offers similar examples of city-states achieving equal prominence in history while remaining comparatively small. Geneva, Florence, and Venice, to name a few. This viewpoint is not the only one in existence, with a new one emerging with the work of Thomas Hobbes in the 17th century. In his book Leviathan, Hobbes argues that the virtue so important to Aristotle vanishes when humanity forms a political association. This allows for a much larger civil body to exist, formed from the aggregate of citizens set on achieving great things with limitations existing only in their chosen civil associations. In this view, once a sovereign entity exists that can enforce the rules of such an association, that nation can continue to grow until it reaches the limits of said entity's power. Expansion would motivate such a state to continue growing increasing the power of the sovereign along the way. Thus, the title of Hobbes' book comes into focus, a true leviathan on the global stage. It is here where we move to discuss David Hume's views on scale and size, which one could describe as making the best from these two disparate viewpoints. Hume maintained a love of small republics, wherein true civilization found its birth and where smaller republics could enjoy a state of equality non-existent in larger civilizations. Hume explains this viewpoint by describing large monarchical regimes as destructive to human nature and massive cities as cesspools of vice and disorder that bled smaller regions dry. Like Aristotle, Hume viewed size as the single most important factor when discerning the material state for moral and political entities. To Hume, the smaller nature of republics served as the stronger bulwark against sovereign aggrandizement and oppression. He envisioned a system of smaller republics joining in a large confederation, wherein each smaller state enjoyed freedom inside its borders, but agreed to restrictions on power when relating to other republics. The existence of competition created an equilibrium, and Hume exalted ancient Greece as the prime example of such a system. In contrast, Hume eviscerates the church, describing it as the overpowering, overreaching sovereign giant that Europe had finally broken free of as it attained a place akin to ancient Greece's equilibrium of power. Hume's narrow-sightedness rises to the surface here, as no historian would look at European history prior to the 20th century with its near constant imperial, monarchical, or religious wars and describe it as ever attaining an equilibrium of power and peace. In that, it also imitated Greece, which also never attained the perfect equilibrium Hume describes. However, in making the argument for this equilibrium, Hume describes his modern nations as attaining a level of cultivation that outstripped the ancient Greeks, with a more developed sense of humanity and the rule of law and liberty. Here, Hume falls into the trap of aristocratic hubris. He he even views citizens in terms of those of aristocratic birth and those who are not, describing the attainment of excellence as only possible through emulation of the perfect citizens, which always included the intellectual and aristocratic elites. To this point, Hume is not wrong that societies had advanced in philosophical and political
political understanding, but the continued reliance on the noble citizen as the role model puts that growth into question. Hume is not unique in this arrogance, as most men of European origin and history, particularly those of noble birth, viewed themselves as superior to all others. Even the church fell prey to this flaw, with Christians the world over conducting their great commission in terms of massed forced conversion to the better way, or massed extinction at their own hands. However, I digress. Hume maintains that the monarchical regime can function like a republic if it remains civilized. Once it gives in to the allure of absolute power, it exceeds its power, and then society must replace it. While Hobbes would argue for an ongoing concept of sovereignty derived from theological discussions applied to centralized monarchical states, Hume rejected the concept. In Hume's view, a free state divides power to limit the risk of absolute power. Here is the virtue of Aristotle's state. Hume argues that a society can grow much larger than Aristotle once argued, but it can only do so in a divided power arrangement that stood in opposition to Hobbes' view on sovereign united power. One can almost see the religious versus secular undercurrents in play. Hobbes attempted to create a scenario wherein a theological concept of sovereign power could be justified in a single monarchical office distinct from any one individual. Hume argues that power divided prevents absolute corruption that would lead to oppression and the downfall of civilization. When such corruption occurs, Hume sees the right of lawful resistance to restore the balance. Hobbes describes the same power to resist in anarchical terms. It is here that we must wrap up. This conversation only briefly touched on scale and size in relation to a state's power. I highly recommend further study on this subject, as I could barely tackle the large amount of material in this discussion. This will be the last one for my current class. Spring break and editing of my sequel awaits. My next class starts in a few weeks, and we shall see what lovely discussions it brings forth. Soon I should also return to the How to Dissertate series, as I'm hopefully progressing into more dissertation-focused classes after this semester finishes. Until next time!